Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Diana Campoamor, president of Hispanics in Philanthropy, which invests in Latino leaders and communities to build a more prosperous and vibrant America and Latin America. Diana has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Diana, for joining us today. Good to be here with you, Mark. It's so interesting to be talking about philanthropy in this time when there is this fear of the other, mm -hmm. this fear of, in particular, um, Latino and Hispanic communities have been called out as if uh, Latino and Hispanic communities are in some way alien to the United States, which is just a, a, an astounding lack of knowledge of our history. Mm -hmm. Talk about the importance of philanthropy mm -hmm. in building a civil society. You know, philanthropy at the end of the day is about giving. Yes, the tax exemption has helped, um, you know, to build important organizations, foundations that give a significant amount of money. But, you know, most of the giving is done by regular Americans, you know, to their church, to their hospital, to their school, and so on. Latinos, who are 56 million of us, here in the United States are part of that giving. And what's happening is that the public discourse has to blame someone. And so they are blaming Latinos as if we are the takers. Well, in fact, we are the givers. We are the givers of economic prosperity. We're the givers of family values. We are you know, the, the givers of um, you know, a number of small businesses and, you know, of an evolving America that is much more philanthropic. And so, you know, to me, the merit of philanthropy, for example, during this season is, you know, the opportunity to include people so that civic engagement becomes, um, you know, a part of that democratic muscle that we all engage. Right now, um, there are many Latinos who are not registered to vote, who have registered to vote for this election. There are a number of terrific organizations, many of them small, you know, organizations with budgets of less than half a million dollars. But those organizations are the energy behind new leadership. The people who are in their 20s and 30s are cutting their teeth in organizing their communities, in raising the leadership, in raising their voice, in understanding public policy. And one of the things that I think is so this. interesting is that the financial wherewithal mm -hmm. to give to uh, or, and, and to give give on mm -hmm. um, it really comes from the community itself, uh, not only in the form of of taxes which we all pay in order to support uh, uh, government institutions, but also in terms of giving to schools, giving to churches, giving to small organizations that help our community. Talk about how you develop the resources um, for Hispanics in, in, in philanthropy. Mm -hmm. And then what do you do with those resources? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think there's a number of ways, you know, to develop those resources. One of the ways that institutional philanthropy can help is by being a leverage. So let me give you an example. Um, a few years ago, um, most organizations that were local and on the ground, they didn't have access to the Ford Foundation or Rockefeller, Kellogg, very large foundations. But by investing, for example, in a funders collaborative, you can have the Rockefeller Foundation investing with the Castellano family, you know, which is a family that won the lottery, and with you know, uh, John Garcia and Amelia Gonzalez, who are also individual donors, and Bob Reveles and a number of others who give you know, in a way that, you know, is not institutional, but in a way that adds not just money, but value, ideas, community cement. What is your current budget? Our operating budget is about four million, four and a half million dollars. And how much of that money 
uh, goes out in regrants? It varies because we are we we don't have an endowment, um, so money passes through. So in one year we could have ten million dollars passing through, and in another year we could have four hundred thousand dollars passing through. So you know, for example, um, during the uh, the the Central American Children's um, uh, tragedy, uh, we had you know over two million dollars passing through just in a couple of months. And not only that, but we were able to leverage additional sources from governments, from churches, and from individuals. So that's a large amount. But we, unlike a regular foundation, we don't have an endowment that has a, a particular uh, payout every year. Do you have particular areas, uh, children and family, um, uh, international programs, education, and so on, that you um, have particular expertise in and that, and that become the nexus for some of your giving? We are a network of over 800 people. And by the way, you know, uh, we're a network that does not exclude. We like to say you don't have to be Hispanic to be hip. And so our board includes non-Latinos, you know, whites and African-Americans and Asians and people of, you know, men and women, people of all kinds. I think what brings us together is, you know, the understanding that we're all going to be better if this group of people has, you know, the investments that they need in order to be prosperous. So to your question, uh, those 800, 1,000 people that are part of the network, those are the experts. So what we do is like good journalists, you know, there's, there's a, an issue, we respond to it, and the way that we respond to it is by bringing the expertise of the network that allows us to keep a, you know, a fairly lean budget and to be agile in ways that most foundations can't be agile. In terms of, of your evolution, talk about your founding mm -hmm. and, and then bring us up to date, up to date and, and where do you think you're going to be headed in the next several years? As, demographic as mm -hmm. demographics of the country shift, mm -hmm. you're going to have to evolve. Mm -hmm. and, and I'd like to talk sure. a, a little bit about that, but let's first talk about your past. When were you founded? So we were founded in, in 1983 um, by uh, Herman Gallegos, who was the first Latino to serve on the Rockefeller Foundation board, uh, by Luz Vega Marquis, who is now the head of the uh, Marguerite Casey Foundation, and by Elisa Arevalo, who at the time was the head of the Wells Fargo Foundation. So basically they went to a conference, a conference in, on philanthropy, the Council on Foundations Conference, and they started looking around and they didn't see people like them. And it was a time when African Americans and women and others were forming groups, women in philanthropy, the Association of Black Foundation Executives. And so the three of them got together and said, you know, there's about, this is, this is something you know that we could we could do, and you know so they they decided to start Hispanics in philanthropy, but it wasn't until you know six seven eight years later that we had enough people working in the field to be able to even have a party. Now we have large parties. <laughs> So do you think that, that your future is going to be more international, leveraging the U.S. tax code to improve investments south of our border mm -hmm. in order to improve life mm -hmm. uh, in those countries and therefore reduce the, the pressure for, uh, for illegal immigration? Uh, you know, I think that's, that's one of the great opportunities. I think there's many opportunities, including, for example, um, Mexicans can now vote in elections uh, in Mexico as well as here in the United States. So double citizenship means that people here have a say in their countries of origin. We can advance democracy in our countries of origin, but I think over the next 10 years, you know, we're going to see more digital philanthropy. We're going to see an expansion of what it means to be a giver. You know, we're going to see, you know, the metaphor of giving translate also into civic engagement and civic engagement translate into, um, you know, 
public policy muscle. Um, and I think this, this, you know, what was, you know, the province of corporations, this notion of transnational or global work is going to be more and more the province of the civil sector. Because indeed what happens in Mexico, what happens in Cuba, ha you know, impacts the United States and impacts, you know, our families. You know, Latinos in the United States are the highest source of income for most of the countries in Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean. So we can either look at that and just say, okay, well, I hope they make money and send money home, or we can think about how that becomes a leverage for many other things, democracy, citizen diplomacy, um, you know, investments in home country, um, any number of things. This is such a fascinating topic and more to come I'm sure, as history unfolds, and we are living that history. Diana Campoamor, thank you so much for sharing your experience uh, with us, and thank you so much for your insights. Thanks.